Good to have all you back here again today. Back again for our second day of this gospel meeting. Of course, we're glad to have them with us. Teach us more. Um, for as we uh, get started, though, uh, suppose I'll actually I suppose I'll lead us in a prayer first, and then we'll have a song, and I'll let Ben come up and do his thing. If you'll pray with me as we get started. Lord, we come before you now. We thank you for this wonderful blessing of the day you've given all of us to be able to come out and to be together here and that we can learn more from your word and learn more from our beloved brother Ben Hall who's come all the way here to be with us this weekend. Ask that that can edify all of us. We can be built up together through this message that we can know more, that we can more properly do your will, that we can be able to encourage one another as you would have us do. All things, of course, your will be done. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Before we get started with the first lesson for today, we're going to see number 112 if you're using the book, Teach Me Thy Way. Teach me. Matthew 6 is where we're, uh, 
we're going to get started here in just a minute. It's all right. Um, for this first one, I think we're going to flip what we did yesterday. Um, yesterday, I just kind of talked for the first one, and we all talked together for the second. I think we'll reverse that today and uh, try to share in some discussion for our for our first uh, study this morning. Um, thanks, by the way, for yesterday. I thought it was just really encouraging for me to be able to connect with y'all, get to know you, and um, share some time talking about things that matter. It's been great already for me, so thank you again. I want us to talk about prayer for the next little bit. And uh, maybe before we dive into the text we'll look at and kind of the reason why I think it, this text is really important for understanding Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, help me, let's talk about how important was prayer for Jesus and for the early church. So I'm thinking about if you just picked up the Gospel of Luke, the book of Acts, and you start reading um, what are some things you can think of? Maybe some stories or maybe just general impressions as far as what you would say. And I'm, I'm not saying what your personal opinion is about how you feel about prayer. I hope we all feel pretty good about prayer. But we're talking about what do we see in the scriptures in Jesus and in the early church um, about the place of prayer, the importance of prayer, how prayer related to a life of somebody who's trying to serve God, somebody who's trying to follow Jesus. What do you think? What are, what are some things that you, you can think of that tell us about Prayer. It's got to be pretty important because in um, Acts chapter 2, where, uh, towards the end of the chapter, it talks about how they continued in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, prayer, breaking of bread. Yep. Um, it's got to be important because it was included in all of those. There's lots of other stuff. First, I, I gather they probably were fasting, you know, they were singing songs. That didn't get listed though in that list, to your point. Prayer is one of the things that got listed in that list that is really, uh, it's a pillar that other stuff is built upon. I love that. It's a great reference there. Other thoughts, either in Jesus' own life or in the, the life of the early church, um, ways we can see the, the, the place of prayer. Yeah. So Paul told the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, it was very important to Jesus. Obviously, he spent a lot of time in prayer, and I'm pretty sure we don't have all of his prayers recorded. But he made time for prayer. Yeah. And uh, he, before he chose his apostles, he spent all night in prayer. Uh, and uh, you know, he was God on earth in the flesh, but he spent time talking with his Father. I have that last little point. I mean, I love that. I have the Luke chapter 6, that reference him praying all night, and then he chooses this. So anytime a big decision, he had to leave the crowds, you know. Did, well, like Jesus had a lot of free time on his hand. Jesus might have been the busiest person who ever lived on earth, but he made time. He wasn't too busy to pray, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, but I love that notion. Most of the time when I think about the importance of prayer, I'm like, well, I can't really take care of some stuff, and I'm in trouble down here. I've done something bad, and I need to pray. Jesus never had those thoughts. She's never thought I did something bad. I need to pray. She's never thought I'm really in trouble down here. And maybe that's not exactly true. Maybe we'll see something in a few minutes that it kind of, but, but in general, the motivation for prayer is so different for us. But Jesus, so the reasons why we would think we need to pray, Jesus had even more reasons than that, that he had even beyond it and shows how important it was in his life. Good. Uh, other examples of prayer, other just thoughts you have about what the scripture teaches about the place of prayer in the life of somebody who's serving God. We're planning on moving. And we're praying that this will be in accordance with God. If this is the right thing, or should we stay at our house now? Yeah. You know, so we've done a lot of praying on that. And you see that whenever there was some sort of pivotal life change, they were praying. I'm thinking about Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascended to the Father. What were they doing? I mean, he said, y'all go wait in Jerusalem. Well, they weren't just twiddling their thumbs. Acts chapter 1 says they were in that upper room. And I, I don't think that necessarily means they were just 24-7, never stopped to talk or eat or, or do anything else. Uh, but they were praying. you know. And I know they did other things because Peter got up and told them how they needed to pick another apostle. But, but the point, the description of that whole period was they were praying. That was what was characterizing them most at that time. Yes, ma'am? I was thinking sometimes you need to create those moments of solitude. So you see in Matthew 14 where Jesus told the disciples, get in the boat, go on the other side. He, by himself, went to the mountainside to pray. Yeah. And of course, later we see the walking on the water incident, but sometimes we have to create those moments. For sure, for sure. To communicate that right. maybe to other people in the 
house. Yeah, yeah. leave me alone. I got a foot. I've heard some parents say, kids, if you see me light the candle or this little thing, this is mommy's quiet time. Oh, interesting. So you do you know, this other stuff, but when you see this, try to leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll break your patience for when you don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we could keep going. I mean, when Jesus was baptized, Luke chapter 3, there's this interesting little note that says he was praying. Um, uh, you know, we could just go on and on. And of course, like the culminating moments of Jesus' own life, what did he want to do in the garden? Right. What was he doing on the cross? Right. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Into your hands, I come in my spirit. Father, forgive me. He's praying, even on the cross as he's, as he's dying. So, um, so obviously this is huge, right? This is the very center of our lives. And uh, in the, I like Luke's account of a, of a similar prayer to what we have here in Matthew chapter 6, where one time Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus didn't say, oh, don't worry about it. Prayer is just talking to God. He didn't do that. He said, all right. It's one of the very few times Jesus just gave a direct answer to a request or an inquiry or a, a, an interest that somebody had. He didn't tell, well, he did tell them a parable, but after he gave them a model. And, and sometimes we'll call this the Lord's Prayer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It came from the Lord. Um, however, it's not the Lord's Prayer in the sense that he prayed it. I know he didn't pray it because there's one really big thing in it that he never could have prayed. Um, but, so anyway, I mean, I don't necessarily call it the Lord's Prayer. At least I'm, I'm going to probably do that at some point. Maybe, ha, you did the little thing you said you're not going to do. But in general, let's try to avoid it. Um, really, I think a better way of trying to think about this prayer is to think about it as the disciples' prayer. The disciples' prayer. And I want to say some more about how this prayer really helps us understand how to follow Jesus and, and prepares us and enables us to follow Jesus. And I know these words are really familiar, but let's go ahead and read them because they're what Jesus taught his disciples for how to pray. Verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right. Uh, this prayer is very familiar, and my guess is it may be so familiar. Of course, you know, some, some religions probably make this into a sort of, I'm going to say an incantation. You know what I mean? Almost like it's a magical formula. If you say these words, then you'll be spiritual and that sort of thing. And, and that's, not, um, that's not correct. It's not the right way of thinking. For one, there are many, many prayers in the Bible. Go read through the book of Psalms, which I guess is actually more psalms than prayers, but a lot of them are, are essentially prayers. Um, but read through the letters of Paul. There's a lot of prayers that he prayed that aren't these exact words. So this isn't the only words we can ever say. However, I gotta tell you, if Jesus says, pray like this, I, I wanna try to work at praying like this. Which I'll tell you, for me, I've kind of found at times to say, hey, I'm gonna pray this prayer, maybe <laughs> once in the morning, once in the evening, or a couple of times throughout the day. It's very enriching, not just let me speed through it. You know the little the little guy in Bible study who's got to memorize uh, a scripture and he just, brrr, that, that's not what we're talking about. But to thoughtfully, reflectively pray these words is very useful. I know they're not magic words, and but one more thing I'll say about that just in case we, we ever worry about that or think about that. Uh, in Luke chapter 11, you go compare the text in Luke 11 to this, they're not identical. And so that that very fact shows me that there you've got Jesus giving two different versions of more or less the same stuff, but it's not identical, okay? However, I want us to work with this prayer and try to learn some lessons uh, from it. Yeah. Let me show you something about how it relates to our studies this weekend. You may be like, wait, we kind of did the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount yesterday, but now we're jumping kind of in the middle. What's going on here? Uh, I think actually this prayer, and I didn't, this isn't original to me. I was reading something and, and somebody uh, kind of pointed this out in what I was reading. It was very useful. To so think about how central, we, we just got done talking about how central prayer is in the life of Christ and in the life of the, the early church, the disciples of Christ, and it needs to be central in our life. But this prayer is actually central in the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Uh, okay, so here's how the Sermon on the Mount is laid out. In the beginning, you had an introduction. We kind of looked at that yesterday. The Beatitudes, the blessed are statements, and the similitudes. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That's the introduction. Jesus' big intro. The sermon finishes with a conclusion where Jesus gives some choices uh, that we need to make. And maybe you just call it kingdom judgments in general. We need to make a judgment. Do we, are we going to listen to Jesus or not? And depending on whether or not we do, we're going to face judgment for that. Uh, actually, we'll face judgment either way, I guess you could say. We'll talk about that more explorable on tomorrow. Okay, so you got that's the introduction and conclusion of the sermon. Right? Um, then you've got some moral and re- I'm going to say moral relational instructions. We'll talk about those, Lord willing, in the next session uh, today. A lot of things that Jesus says about how you are and are not supposed to conduct yourself and all that sort of thing. And I apologize. Actually, let's just say 517, not 521. Um so this, this bookend of the main body of teaching ends in chapter 7 and verse 12. I know there's a bookend because actually check out chapter 5 and verse 17. Um, 517, after the introduction, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Then he says some things. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, I think. Um, but then look at 712. 712. So whatever you wish that others would do for you, do to you, do also to them. Why? Why does he say that in verse 12? Why should you treat other people the way you want to be treated? Because this is the law of the prophets. He begins this section, again, I apologize for the typo here. He begins his instruction based on, here's what God's word has been about really from the very beginning. And then he ends it. This is what God's word about has been from the very beginning. Law and prophets, law and prophets indicates to you that that's actually the, the main body of teaching. All right? You go up one other level, and in between, and, and kind of built on and in between this, you've got Jesus give some uh, warnings and some exhortations about being worldly versus being godly. So in chapter 6, he talks about uh, the worldliness of really trying to do your righteousness before others. Social worldliness. I want to impress people. I want to get the right spot in society. At the end of chapter 6, again, right before this part, so right after this part, right before this part, he's got this, uh, another warning about worldliness versus godliness, talking about material goods. So it's not uh, in the beginning of chapter 6, it's, hey, watch out for the worldliness of trying to be impressive to other people. At the end of chapter 6, it's the warning about being worldly in regards to um, getting a lot of stuff and securing yourself with your stuff, which you can imagine, you can see how these kind of relate to each other, and we can probably talk about a lot of interesting things. But anyway, so here's the bookends, here's the middle part, here's the middle part of that middle part, and what's at the very center of it, pray then in this way. So the way some have some characterized it, that prayer is at the center of the center of the center of the teaching that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you're like, who cares? And that's fine if you don't, I thought it was interesting. But here's, what I, here's the reason why I think it matters. Prayer has to be at the center of our lives if we're going to be true disciples. If it's at the center of Jesus' teaching, everything else radiates out from it. If you want to be a godly person, you better be praying. If you want to know how to live righteously, you better be praying. If you want to fulfill God's expectations for what God, the, the will of Christ as he reveals in his teaching here, you better be praying. In many ways, prayer is where we learn how to be followers of Jesus. I want to be clear about something here. And, and actually, I want to say it this way because I think a lot of people believe this. If we went around to a lot of different churches and said, hey, do you learn things when you pray? And if they said yes, how do you think they would explain to us how that might work? If you ever had somebody tell you that, I learn things when I pray or God reveals things to me when I pray. What do people mean? If, if, I, if someone were to say that, what do people normally mean when they say that? And maybe you've never heard anybody say that before, but I imagine probably you have. What do you think people mean when they say, God reveals things to me when I pray, or I learn things when I pray? I think, I think they usually mean that they get more clarity about the thing they're praying about. Okay. Yeah. Meaning just the, the period of reflection just I'll open yeah. something up to. Okay, cool. Good. Other thoughts about what people might mean? Uh, patience is a virtue, but sometimes prayers help me delay a decision. Which maybe helps with a clear piece, right? Yes. Alright, let's see. I think you guys are hitting on the right kinds of ways of thinking about how prayer is really important for us to understand God, to learn God's will. Uh, I think these are good. I'll tell you, some people what they mean is, I pray 
and God gives me an idea. So I don't know what to do. I, I don't know whether or not I should move. Right? And I pray about it, and I hear a voice in my head, and I must be God answering my prayer. Now, I know there's some things that kind of sound like that in the scriptures, but I'll just tell you, I don't believe that's how God operates through prayer for his people. Maybe with his prophets, with his apostles, that sort of thing might have happened. But it's not the way uh, that God operates with people who pray in general. Even in the Bible, that's not really how it works. It's certainly not in our day and age. There's a lot of things we can say about that. But what, what these two brothers uh, kind of highlighted, I think, are some helpful ways for us to think about. Prayer is very important for us to be disciplined, kind of like... Whenever you're singing songs, maybe even we sang that song this morning. Did you learn something? I hope so. That's kind of the point. Any kind of worship, any kind of meditation, any kind of reflection on God's will is meant to help us, to train us as disciples. And this prayer that Jesus gives us to pray is training. Again, whenever they said, teach us to pray, Jesus didn't say, ah, just say whatever you want because, you know, prayer is just talking to God. Don't worry about it. Don't get me wrong. There's sometimes we just need to pray whatever's on our heart, whatever's on our mind. I think it's Hannah in uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 1, or I think it's 1 Samuel 1, talking about she was pouring out her soul to God. Sometimes that's what prayer is. You're just dumping yourself out before God. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, prayer is also meant to be a training ground for us, uh, a transformation for us, something that draws us deeper into the will of God. Let's just get started here. All right. First thing about this, uh, the disciples' prayer is we're learning how to follow Jesus. I want to I suggest some things, and let's talk about them a little bit. The first thing I'd like to note from this prayer is that uh, how important prayer is for helping us understand the form of our relationships. Relationships are really important to us. As human beings, we're relational beings. We talk all the time. We've kind of supercharged that in our day and age with all the technology that we have to be able to talk. We may not be talking very well, but we're talking a lot more because we kind of want to. We have this craving to, to communicate, to uh, connect, to be a part of other people's lives and to have them a part of our lives. Even the most introverted of us or the people that don't like people, we know that there's at least a small pocket of relationships that are really important to us. And I need to have them and I got to have them. And that's something that really is critical for my life. Jesus, in teaching us to pray, um, is training us to have the proper formation for our relationships. Uh, let me just run for a second, then I'd like to open it up for you all to kind of, you may have some additional thoughts on this, or you may have some, some things to kind of drill down on a little bit more. Really, I'll tell you the main place I'm keying in on this is how he starts the prayer. And, sorry, I should have I told you to not look. But think about the way, and I honestly don't remember how anybody started prayers today or yesterday, so I'm not being picky. I, I'm not even saying what I'm about to say is wrong because I do the same thing. If I'm going to start my prayer to God, one way to start it, a biblical way to start it would be, um, God most high, blah, 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 blah. Uh, creator of all things, blah, 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 blah. Lord of all, blah, 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 blah. How does Jesus say we should pray? How does he teach us to pray? What's the first two words? Our Father. So much so that actually some people call this prayer the Our Father, right? Our Father. How do you think, let's just pretend I told you, hey, when I just was checking with you. I know, I know you, you're, you're wise. Um, I want to see about my prayers. This is how I start every single prayer. I've just kind of made it my practice. Every time I start my prayer, I start out with God Most High. Every single time. That's how I pray. Every single prayer. And then you know what Jesus said. Jesus said, you're supposed to pray our Father. <clears throat> if I only ever prayed God Most High, and I never started my prayers our Father, what do you think might be kind of missing or kind of off in my relationship or my understanding of my relationship with God? What do you think? This is an opinion question, so I know it's right in a lot of ways you can go. Well, let's pretend I never prayed our Father, and I only prayed God, or fill the blame with something else. What do you think that would do to me if I never prayed our Father? I think your relationship would be less personal. How so? Because to say God most high or something like that implies that it's just a master-slave sort of relationship. Right. And while that's definitely part of it, that's not, that's not all. So if you're only 
Probably right. Talk some more. What, what else? You think? And then you can insert other phrases besides God Most High. Do something else. But just if I never prayed this, our, our, if I never started my prayers, Our Father uh, in Heaven, what would that do to me? What do you think? What do you think I'd be missing? It's repetitive, and I think it says that this is what you think of God. Great. And it may be what I think of God now, but also if I keep praying it. It's what's going to keep me thinking of God in that way, right? Jesus was teased, I didn't pray like this. In other words, I wonder if they didn't really think of God in this way. I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, it was very rare for Israel to pray or to worship God in terms of him as a father. It's there, um, Isaiah 64, I think it is. There's a couple places in the Psalms. Where, but it was actually not very common for uh, Israel to pray to God in this way as our father. This is kind of revolutionary whenever Jesus said, this is how you ought to pray as our father. Jesus is training us to have the right relationship with God. And I'll say there's different, so intimacy or, or dependence, you know, with God as our Father. That's one thing we learned, because we're talking about dependence in a minute. Um, but also, by the way, there's um, there's a, an implication of, of commitment and commitment to the authority of God. A father rules over his children with love and compassion and all that sort of and wisdom, but also like, Whenever children speak to their father and call him father, that's an acknowledgement of, I have a special responsibility to you. I have a special allegiance to you, and you have a special authority over me. Jesus is teaching us. In prayer, we learn to have the proper formation of our relationship with God. By the way, if you're never praying, God's going to feel really far away. Maybe I should say more importantly than he'll feel far away. He is going to be far away from you. Not because he's kicking you out of the house, because you're never talking to him. You're never drawing near to him. You're never drawing near to the throne. And so he is going to be far away from you in your life. That means that in the times when you least want to pray, you must pray. You might say, well, I don't, I don't think my relationship with God is very good right now. Exactly. Prayer is about the proper formation of that relationship. Prayer forms us for the right relationship with God. Um, okay, but let me say a second thing about this. Jesus taught them to pray. And here's how I think Jesus should have taught them to pray and taught us to pray. Jesus' Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, I'm going to head shakes. Good, correct. Obviously, if I say something different than Jesus, but I'm just saying, by rights, you and me by right have the uh, should we be allowed to call the God who created all things, who we, by the way, rebelled against and have lived as enemies and sinners against, should we have the right to call him our father? He's not really. At least we've made him not that anymore. We left him. But Jesus said, hey, my father is your father. In other words, in prayer, we don't just learn the right relationship with us and God himself, the father, but it also trains us in our relationship with Christ. Christ is, and again, there's lots of ways Jesus is described, but what does Hebrews chapter 2 say about Christ? It says, he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. His brothers. How does that alter the way you, and he's the elder brother, he's the firstborn, but why is that important? to think of Jesus as your brother. What do you think? Why is it important to think of Jesus as your brother? Because we all have the same father. We're all connected to the same father. The life Jesus has is the life I have. We're all part of the same thing. Keep going. And there's lots, of, I don't know all the right answers. I'm uh, counting on y'all to be prayerful folks who've been learning these things and thinking about it. Well, what else do you think? Why else is it important for us to think of Jesus as our think brother? even when you do have just the one, like, you are the child and God is the father. That's one thing. But having even another point of reference with a Jesus suddenly makes that feel a lot more like a family rather than just like a father and just picked up like a lost child along the way. And yeah. Went about that. It, it feels like a, a fuller family in that sense. Great. Great. That's really good. I want to come back to that in a couple of minutes. Keep going. What else do you think? Why else is it important? Or why else would it be important for us to think of Jesus, to understand Jesus 
to relate to Jesus as our brother. <laughs> you may have brothers. Uh, sorry. Yeah. If you have, whether or not you have a good relationship with your brother, what, what is the, what's the notion of a brother supposed to mean? Even in, in human terms. But I, I just think I have a built-in partner. Yeah, great. Which is important. Why? Because um, we, we care about each other. Yeah, great. Yeah. I know there's somebody who's got my back all the time. We feel that with our earthly brothers who may live hours away from, barely get to see as much as we want or whatever, and who we butt heads with, and who isn't perfectly wise and isn't really that much stronger than me or whatever. But even with those brothers, it's important to us. How much more so to have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator and sustainer of all, the perfect Holy One of God to be our brother. Prayer is God's training ground where we learn the formation of the right kind of relationship with Christ. And I want to come back to what Isaac said. It's not just that Jesus didn't say, uh, pray, Almighty God. He said, pray, Father. Pray our Father. You need to think about God in that way. Jesus said, our Father. My Father is your Father, in other words. But he also said, hey, he didn't say, pray, my Father. He said, pray, our Father. And let me note something else with you here. Just note in general throughout this prayer, the pronouns. Uh, if I'm using the, the right English term here. Here's how I think sometimes we may think about prayer or sometimes the way we may pray. Again, if we were just writing this prayer. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread and forgive me my debts as I have also forgiven my debtors and lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. If I counted right, there are nine, at least nine, plural pronouns in this uh, prayer. And zero, first person personal. I know there's the personal about God, you, and your. But there's no me and my and I. You notice that? And here's what's funny. This is in the context of Jesus saying, hey, when you pray, don't be praying you know, to get attention for it. Go in your closet, shut the door, do it in secret. But it's not personal. Pri uh, prayer, there's public prayer and there's private prayer. But prayer is never personal. Don't get me wrong. I know you read the, the Psalms where, you know, people cry. But I'm saying the baseline that Jesus teaches us to pray is about us. We're part of a bigger family, in other words. And it makes me think differently about all of y'all whenever I pray correctly, whenever I pray like Jesus teaches me to pray. I'm not just be thinking about myself. Uh, some have pointed out that actually the model prayer, you could take the, the greatest command, which Jesus broke into kind of two parts, to love God with everything you got and to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And that's actually the essence of this prayer. It's just expressions of loving God and loving others. Prayer is crucial for us to learn the proper formation, or to have our relationships formed in the right kinds of ways with God, with Jesus, and with all of God's people. I think this stuff is really important to think about. Prayer as relationship formation. Uh, let, let me stop for a second. What do you, what, you guys may want to offer some comments or observations or maybe some other things you see in this that, that help us with this idea to think about it. How important is it, do you think, to pray verbally? Your actual voice rather than basically internally just throw the thoughts. Because I was taught growing up that both were valid and that there wasn't any particular advantage to one over the other. But lately, I feel as though the act of speaking prayer, even if it's just quiet, with no one else to hear, it has a different effect on my on me. I can only speak for myself. God gave us bodies that function in a variety of ways, and those functions have spiritual purposes. I mean, that's true from the beginning, and you see that in, in the New Testament as well. Um, so actually, I'll just uh, you know, kind of up the ante a little bit. Not only prayer, but also uh, reading scripture, I think, is much more beneficial to do it out loud than to do it in my head quietly. I will say, um, if, if I'm reading it correctly, 1 Samuel chapter 1, 
where Eli the priest saw a woman who was moving her lips, and as I understand it, she wasn't actually speaking, um, and he thought she was a drunk lady, and she said, no, no, I was just praying super hard. Okay, well, that, that would be, and her prayer was literally answered in a big way. So that would be one, um, one example of someone who was not verbally praying, so their prayer was still valid and very impactful. I'd say similarly in the book of Nehemiah, I gather, I can't prove this, I don't think, but in Nehemiah chapter one, Nehemiah was asked a question by the king, and then it says, I prayed to the God of heaven. I don't think that means Nehemiah was like, King, I'll be right back. And he ran to a room, prayed a prayer, and then came back. I think the implication is he just shot a prayer up in his head right then. So I do think that the scriptures support the notion of silent prayer, um, you know, if you want to call it mental prayer, thought prayer, whatever. However, I absolutely agree with you. Um, even the fact that Jesus' prayers are recorded, the prayers Jesus himself prayed, indicates he prayed them out loud. Um, the same for the apostles and so forth. So that's my take on that. Go ahead. I think just from a practical perspective, it's a lot easier to stay focused on a prayer Thank when you, it's yeah. out loud yeah, than right. just, and, and also on scripture, than just your thoughts kind of drifting midway through. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. For that same reason, some people write out their prayers Great. so that they can stay focused. Great, oh, that's right. Yeah, I love that God didn't require us to speak our prayers because, for one, I may be in a circumstance where I'm not able or allowed to speak. I also may have some sort of physical uh, uh, incapacity to be able to speak, and so God hears our prayers no matter how they come, which is a beautiful thing. I think. All right, any other thoughts on this idea of how um, praying as Jesus teaches us is is um, vital for us learning the proper form of our relationships? I was thinking that I really struggle with the idea of charity, not the idea of actually implementing yeah. it properly in my life. And I think really what you said about the pronouns that were used in the, this model of prayer could really go a long way how we just to change those patterns of thought that I have. That, so it's hard to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and then see someone in need, whether it's a neighbor, or certainly a brother or sister in Christ, you'd be like, hmm, and just go on. I literally just prayed for this, so I guess I got to do it because I may be the answer to the prayer. Or um, it's really hard to pray, forgive us our debts, and to withhold forgiveness from someone else. Because I just prayed to God, I hope that you'll forgive me and this other person, so if I hope God will forgive them, I guess I've got to forgive them too. You know what I mean? Like it really is. It cultivates real love in our hearts for God, for Christ, and for each other if we learn to pray this way. Just for further study, if you want to look into this, I would encourage you to look at the prayers in the letters of Paul, which are highly relational and are, are highly emphasized relationality, especially I'll say uh, a couple of prayers in the book of Ephesians, I think kind of hit on this. And I think you'd also argue probably the one in Philippians chapter one. Go read Paul's prayers. He prays about these kinds of things. All right, let's go into another idea here about what kind of training, what kind of learning, what kind of growth um, happens for us whenever we pray as Jesus teaches us. So if the first thing we noted is this prayer teaches us, uh, we learn the formation of right relationships. We also learn a reorientation of our perspectives and priorities. So, Let's just, and you don't have to out yourself, you don't have to do your own, but let's just try to pretend that we could be in most people's prayer log. I don't know, that's not a real thing. But let's pretend there was a divine spreadsheet of all the things that you pray about, the frequency with which you pray about them, and all that sort of thing. What do you think would be some of the, the heavy hitters? And I know I'll also be like, forgive us our debts and lead us not into me. No, no, be honest. Like, what are the things we as people typically go to God with uh, in our prayers? What do you think? The most frequent things, the most urgent things that we go to God with in our prayers. To uh, help a person that is ill Great. or, or uh, grieving Great. Uh, to make them comfortable. Yes, wonderful. That's a great example. Uh, by the way, James 5, we should pray for those who are ill. All right. So this isn't bad. These aren't bad things, but I do want us to note, like, what are the things that we pray about the most and maybe compare it to what Jesus has to say? Yes, I'm in. He will soon, I know he will. Uh, what else? What else? Pray in, pray in for sickness, illness, something like that. Go ahead, please. I pray every day, keep me away from the sin. Great. Which is a little closer to that, lead me not. That's kind of your, you're kind of just re rewording what Jesus says about lead us not into temptation. Yeah, good. 
Give me some other ones that, uh, that tend to dominate our prayers, tend to fill our prayers up a lot. Anybody have things at work or finances that they pray about pretty frequently? That stuff's concerning. Don't know how to do that, deal with that. Um, maybe circumstances in the world around us. And I don't just mean maybe like First Timothy 2 teaches us we should do that. You should pray for all men, especially for those who are in authority. Sometimes some of us are like, Lord, could you please put so and so in the void? <laughs> and I, I don't mean I'm not picking anybody. I'm saying it's a constant kind of you know thing that happens, right? Um, okay, what does Jesus tell us we should pray? And here's I guess punchline: a lot of times our prayers are dominated by basically whatever I think is important, or whatever I would like, or whatever is most pressing to me. Which usually, I'm still trying to grow up in the Lord. Usually, too much the things that I think are important are basically worldly stuff, you know, um, temporal stuff, stuff that in the grand scheme really don't matter. God wants to hear all our prayers, okay? We bring it all to Him. But what are the priorities that, that Jesus lays out here in, um, in this passage? Uh, if I'm reading it correctly, there are seven petitions. Uh, there's it's an interesting thing about even with the, if the word petition is exactly the right word to use, but we'll, we'll just go with it. Seven petitions in this prayer. <clears throat> Only one of them relates to any kind of day-to-day -day circumstances. You notice that? Now, I want to come back to that in just a minute. That's the, the give us this day our daily bread thing. Um, so, by the way, that kind of proves to me that we should come to God with those day-to-day -day concerns. They're not irrelevant. But six of them are about really things that don't have that much to do with me. First, what's the first uh, petition or the first request? If you were to, to put it out, what's the first first petition here? Give us our daily bread. Well, that's uh, I think that may be about number four, if I'm reading it right, three, three or four. Your will be done. Your will be done is one of the early ones. You could even back it up before that. Kingdom come. Your kingdom come. <laughs> Right. And depending on how you want to read Hallowed Be Your Name, that may be another one before that. All right, so is that what dominates your prayers? God, your kingdom come? You pray a lot about God's kingdom coming, you know, um, in the lives of people around you who are not submitted to Christ. God's kingdom coming into your life even more that God would rule over you. God's kingdom coming in parts of the world where the gospel is not flourishing, or at least as far as we can tell, isn't flourishing as much as it is in other places. Maybe, by the way, it may not be flourishing in America, maybe one of the places we're talking about in, in the Western world. Sometimes we think about Africa, the Middle East, and, and Asia, and actually it's kind of doing good over there. Um, but you guys get my point, right? This is what we're supposed to be praying about, Jesus says. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, that's a different set of priorities. Sometimes what we think in prayer is, prayer is me trying to convince God to do the stuff that I would like him to do. And I got to tell you, read through the scriptures. There are times when people just appeal to God on things that they just wanted him to do. And God is gracious and he's a good father and he actually would do it. But that's not really what prayer is for. Uh, someone has said, we shouldn't think of prayer as me convincing God to do my will. But rather, prayer is where I need to be learning to do God's will. It's a reorientation of my perspectives, my priorities, the things that I'm real worked up about. I'll just say this. Check yourself over the next several months. Do you pray more prayers about the kingdom of the United States? Or are you going to be praying more prayers about the kingdom of God, which spans heaven and earth? Which one are you going to be praying more for and more about? That's pretty challenging, I think, and confronts us with what our real priorities are. And, and what really, maybe one way to put this is, prayer is where we have our worldview shaped. Worldview is, how do I see what's important? How do I see where all this thing came from and where it's all going and what the point of it all is? And if we would learn to pray as Jesus teaches us to pray in this prayer, to prioritize the things that he prioritizes, it will give us a different view of the world around us to where you know what? If I would just pray, at least pray, your kingdom come. Let's just pretend I only committed to that part. 
and for the next six or eight or however many months it is until we get to November, if that's all I pray, your kingdom come every day. And maybe I just told myself, if I ever pray about anything going on politically, it's only going to be under the umbrella of, God, I just want your kingdom come and your will to be done. That's all I'm praying for. I wonder if we'd be as nervous on whatever that Tuesday night will be in November. I don't know what the date is. I wonder if we'd be all that worked up about either result. I kind of bet we won't. Because we'll say, hey, you know what? God is going to bring his kingdom come. And it doesn't matter how bad America gets or how great America is or what happens in the United States or any other nation of men. I got a, I got a higher perspective than this temporal political sphere. I've got bigger priorities than what may happen with whatever in this place. Prayer is where we gain a reorientation of our perspective and our priorities. And I'll tell you, the Psalms are really useful for this. Have you ever read some of the Psalms? What's the mood of a lot of the Psalms? How do they talk? And you don't have to, you don't have to quote one. I know sometimes it's kind of, but what, what do you think when you read the Psalms? How are they feeling? What are they thinking? How are they talking a lot of times? What do you think? How would you describe it? Distressed. Very distressed. Sometimes to the point where they're like, God, where are you? I heard somebody say, I don't know if this is a statistical truth, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's good vibes of a statement. They said, the cry of the Psalms is, how long? And that does come up pretty often. How long? And it's usually not how long, you know, and they're real patient about it. They're worked up. But you read those same Psalms, and what happens by the end of it? They start out upset, distressed, maybe even angry, maybe angry with God. But then by the end, they'll say things like, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. Or they'll say things like, I know, God, that you are good. You know what I'm saying? Prayer is where we get that reorientation of our perspective and our priorities. We need to learn to pray like this, to not just pray that God would get his perspective lined up with me or get his priorities in line with my priorities. No. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm trying to learn to have my perspective and my priorities oriented by his. Go ahead, please. Anybody else wants to add a comment before we move on? Go ahead. I think prayer should also be when something good has happened to you. Thank you. You should pray to God to thank him for what has taken place. Something we're trying to do, you know, we've, we've tried with our kids. They're not great at memorizing stuff. We try. It's probably their dad, too, is a problem here. But, um, but with the model prayer, for instance, with right. this prayer for, for disciples, it's kind of an interesting thing to do is to flip it. You know, if you pray this at the beginning of the day, it's God, please do all these things. You get to the end of the day, and some of them you kind of flip around. God, thank you for giving us our daily bread and much more and all these other things you give. God, thank you for forgiving us for that fight we had earlier in the day. God, thank you for delivering us from the evil one. You know what I mean? Like all this stuff, you can flip it right around into Thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks, the Spirit says. All right, good. Uh, other thoughts about how prayer is a training ground, a, a place where we learn to reorient our worldview, our perspectives, our priorities. Anything y'all want to add to this before we move on to one other uh, thought? I think. All right. Here's the third thing uh, I'd like to suggest in this prayer. But what we learn is we learn the way of Jesus through prayer. We learn first formation of right relationships. We learn a reorientation of our perspective and priorities. We learn to be trained in simple childlike dependence. I'm going away from Matthew 6. I'd like to actually read this one. I know I've been referencing a few. Go over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 and verse number 1. Matthew 18 and verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put, them, put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, or I think some translations say, unless you are converted and become like children. We talk about conversion from being, oh, I was a sinner and then I was baptized and I was saved. That's good. But Jesus said, if you want to be converted, the real conversion is to become like a child. If you turn and become like children, uh, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't bother asking about who's the greatest. You won't even be getting in. 
unless you become like children. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The reason why Jesus says we need to, we must become children in order to come into the kingdom isn't to be sweet like children are sweet. They're not always sweet. It's not innocent. Children are not innocent. I mean, I don't mean they're sinners, but I mean they're not very innocent to the parents, right? Whenever Jesus talks about becoming like children, what he's talking about is exactly what he says here. Whoever humbles himself. Children are very humble. I don't know if they're consciously thinking of themselves as humble, but you tell me, in what ways do children uh, prove themselves to be humble or lowly? Go. They'll share. They just say whatever, good and bad. <laughs> Stop saying that. Give me some other examples of how children are humble or lowly. They'll accept correction. They may not like it very much, but they will. They don't fight back whenever they're correct, at least until they start fighting back. You know? They're pretty you... honest. Sorry? They're pretty honest as little yeah. children. Absolutely, yeah. yeah they're, not, they're not pretentious. They're not trying to put on a show like a lot of us. How about uh, whenever they need something, do they try to take care of it on their own? Hey, That's actually something that parents, as kids keep growing up, we got to try to talk them into, hey, you need to like put your own pants on, you know, get yourself a sandwich, you know, like this is, it's time, you know, you're, 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 but they're dependent, they're dependent. And that's really the, the, the essence of the humility of children is they're dependent people. You know, a lot of us think we are really grown up. A lot of us think that we can take care of ourselves. And there's a variety of ways that we think about that. I'm going back to the prayer. I think this is why Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. What a great phrase. Give us. That's what the children says. Dad, give me. And that's the way that God, Jesus is teaching us to talk to our Father. Give us this day. I cannot get for myself. You have to give it to me. Praying this prayer, and I'm not saying we're not responsible to go out and work and provide. We are. But if I'm going out working and providing, how am I doing that? It's not because I'm so strong or so smart that I've got myself together. Because God gave me a body. God gave me a mind. God gives me breath in my lungs every second of every day. God give me what I need to get through the day. Notice also the simplicity of this request. Um, it's not, God, give me a year's supply of non-GMO, uh, whatever, whatever, organic, blah, blah, blah stuff that'll be exactly what I need. That's not the prayer. Give me this day. If you can just get me through today, God, that's what I'm asking for. That's simple. Y'all know, I heard somebody say this uh, the other day, that was a great, great line, exactly right. They were like, you know, if you tell a kid tomorrow, that means never. <laughs> because I'm living right here, you know? I can't even imagine tomorrow. I'm right here, right now. Give us this day. There's a simplicity and a childlike spirit says, God, give me what I need today. And it is what I need. I'm not asking for something extravagant. I'm not asking for something fancy. I'm not asking for something big. I'm actually just asking for you to keep me surviving. Give us this day our daily bread. That kind of spirit is important for us to learn where I say, I'm not taking care of myself and I don't know how, how or if I'll be taken care of tomorrow other than I know that if tomorrow comes, you'll take care of me then too because I'm trusting in you. And prayer is where we learn. See, I think a lot of times we think about prayer, maybe, maybe not, I'll say with me. A problem arises, all right, cool, gotta make a plan. Got to figure out some way to address this and deal with this. Running around doing all this kind of stuff. I'm like, and it doesn't work. So I'm not as grown up as I think I am. And then I say, oh yeah, I should probably pray. Sometimes God has to smack me around a little bit and say, hey, you need to learn to be dependent. What would be better is if I would pray to learn that dependence. Rather than get smacked around with a lot of failure and a lot of heartbreak and disappointment, all that stuff, that stuff's going to come, but it'd be better if I would learn that simple childlike dependence, that humility through prayer. And I'll say it's not just in our daily bread. In prayer, we're learning to participate in a different kind of economy. It's not the economy of taking care of yourself. It's not the economy of earning it. It's not the economy of, it's the economy of grace, which is what that simple childlike dependence leads us to, to say, Father, forgive us 
of our debts. I cannot pay you back. I don't have it. Y'all know the little kid who says, I want to buy mom a Christmas present. And you say, that's great. Where are you getting that money from? I don't know. Can you give me some money? <laughs> you know what I mean? And when it comes to the much more consequential thing of us with God, we say, God, I do not have the money to pay back the wrongs that I've done. But I'm your child, and I'm depending on you to forgive me of my debts. And actually, when I'm running around here in this world, I know that I'm in trouble. I'm out here, and i got no hope to take care of myself. Lead me not into temptation. And deliver me from the, sorry, lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from the evil one. I know I'm vulnerable. I know I need to be rescued. I know I need to be protected. I know I need to be led. We need to be praying so that we will adopt training of becoming simple, dependent, humble children who rely on the grace of God. I know there's a whole lot more in this prayer, but these are three things that I think are really important and why we need to prioritize prayer and why we need to even prioritize this prayer. I'm not saying you just have to recite it word for word, although I will say that's a beneficial discipline. It is for me whenever I do that, and I try to frequently do that. Um, but even in your other prayers, learning to pray these types of things, to learn to have your relationships formed in the right way, with God, with Christ, with others, uh, to learn, to have a reorientation of your perspectives and priorities, to see the world the way God does and not just see the world the way you want to see it or the way that you naturally have learned to see it and to learn this kind of childlike dependence, this kind of humility is really important. And because really ultimately what this whole thing is about is not about, again, us trying to get God to do our will, but for us to fulfill his will for our lives. Whenever Jesus was in the garden, he prayed these words. He fell on his face and he prayed saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But what was he really praying? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And as we, so as we pray, and as we pray this, this prayer Jesus taught us to pray, Really what Jesus is doing is not saying, here's the stuff you need to say to God to unlock what you want. Really what he's saying is, this is the stuff me and my father want you to say so that we can unlock your heart, so that we can get what we're trying to get out of you, so that you'll be changed. I like this verse in 2 Corinthians 3, and I think it's relevant to this discussion. But we all with unveiled faces, and I don't believe this is talking exclusively about prayer, but I'll tell you, prayer would be, caught up in the idea of having an unveiled face, seeing God as he really is, as it refers to even pointing back to Moses on the mountain, if you read the context here. Looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is the prayer of the disciple, of the one who wants to be like Jesus. Let's learn to pray. Maybe it would be good if we just go ahead and pray right now. Our Father in heaven, truly your name is hallowed. And we pray, God, that your name would be honored and hallowed in our lives and every person's life in heaven and on earth. You deserve it. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. And we know, God, that your will is done perfectly in heaven and your kingdom rule is complete in heaven. And we earnestly pray that, starting with ourselves, that we would submit to your kingdom rule, that we would keep your will and do your will every day. We also pray that we'd see that grow more and more in the lives of people around us. I pray for that, for these brethren here in Wallingford. I pray it for our brethren in Brooklyn. I pray it for all your saints everywhere, that we would live in such a way that you'd use us in such a way that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, give us what we need today. We pray for our, our daily bread. We know, Father, you already have given us more than that today and you give us more so much all the time. We pray for the energy and the strength to be able to use our time well today so that we would grow and to be stronger in faith. 
we pray that you give us good health um, so that we'd be able to function in a way that would draw us uh, closer to you. But Father, if we need some kind of hardships or difficulties, if that's what would help us, then give us that. Give us whatever we need today to keep going. Father, we do pray for forgiveness. We pray for forgiveness for our secret sins. We pray forgiveness for our ignorance. We pray forgiveness for things that we don't even perceive that we're doing that are wrong. We know that we're indebted to you so much. We ask your forgiveness and we praise you and thank you that you are a forgiving God. We pray that your forgiveness would teach us to be forgiving, that your grace would teach us to be gracious to others. Father, we know that it's not just you and us in this world. We know that the evil one is against you and against your purposes. And so we pray that you would lead us not into temptation, but you would deliver us from the hand of the evil one. So that in all things, you would receive all the glory and honor and the power now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Take a break for a couple minutes and then we'll be right back in with it. No sleeper. You don't have any slides for the second one. Just make it Thank you. Thanks. That was the first prayer I ever learned. <laughs>